I'm Kat Copeland, ISPU's Director of Communications. Excited to share a conversation today with one of our 2021 Young Scholar Awards winners. Every other year, ISPU holds the Young Scholar Awards competition to highlight and uplift the work of early career researchers whose research focuses on topics related to Muslims in the United States. This year, after months of discussion and deliberation with a panel of scholars, we named our first, second, and third place winners. Today, you'll hear a conversation between myself and our third place winner, Dr. Nahid Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed's topic was titled Measurement of Perceived Interpersonal and Societal Anti-Muslim Discrimination in the United States. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Ahmed on this episode of Deep Dives with ISPU. Nahid, thank you so much for joining us. You conducted research in an area that we are very interested in and often investigating ourselves at ISPU, anti-Muslim discrimination. And your award-winning research project, Measurement of Perceived Interpersonal and Societal Anti-Muslim Discrimination in the United States, you created scales for measuring perceived anti-Muslim discrimination that help assess the health impacts of discrimination on Muslims. Can you describe the development of this project? First of all, thank you for having me on your podcast and thank you for the award on my research. Um, So this research really grew out of a need to examine the health implications of Islamophobia. Some research has been done on this topic, but it's been quite limited for a number of reasons. The first is access to data. And then the second, um, having a scale to actually measure Islamophobia. There are Islamophobia scales out there. But in looking at them and looking at the specific context of the U.S., I thought it was important to develop scales that measured the full spectrum of Islamophobia in the U.S. and that were really grounded in the experiences of Muslim Americans. So to that end, the scales were developed using um, qualitative interviews with 40 Muslim Americans of all ethnic backgrounds and ages, um, having experts who work in this space review the scale items that were developed out of these qualitative um, interviews, And then also asking the intended audience, Muslim Americans themselves, to respond and provide feedback on the scale. So these scales were really developed, you know, based on the experiences of Muslims and were validated and uh, assessed using expert reviews and quantitative data and qualitative data, just so the scales are well-rounded and can be used in a variety of settings. When you began this research project, um, what did you expect to discover in the results? On a fundamental level, based on past studies, I expected to see an association or relationship between Islamophobia and adverse health outcomes. We know from previous studies that Muslim Americans who have experienced Islamophobia have dealt with depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. And we also know it's been linked to Um, maternal and child health outcomes, specifically preterm birth and low birth weight, et cetera. For this study, um, I looked specifically at symptoms of depression, and I did find that exposure to Islamophobia or experience with Islamophobia was associated with symptoms of depression in terms of the symptoms increasing as your experiences increased. What was most surprising about what you discovered, um, something something that perhaps wasn't expected? Given the diversity of Muslim Americans, I expected to hear about varying experiences of discrimination. Um, just given the racial and ethnic diversity of Muslims, they're not only dealing with Islamophobia, they're also dealing with racism, sexism, et cetera. Um, one of the things that surprised me in the, the qualitative interviews was the generational divide in terms of Muslims who were old enough to understand what was going on during the September 11th attacks and those who were really young at the time or who were born after the September 11th attacks. Um, and the difference was primarily around witnessing and experiencing sort of the national security measures that came out of that attack. For example, the Patriot Act, the National Security Entry and Reentry Program, and sort of the large-scale surveillance of Muslims, um, including at masjids, et cetera. So the younger Muslims that I interviewed weren't quite as aware of all these surveillance activities at a national level, um, whereas the, the quote-unquote older Muslims that I interviewed were more aware and cognizant of it and had actually experienced it in terms of having law enforcement agents visit their home 
um, you know, make them go through really invasive security screening um, processes at airports, et cetera. I know in our 2020 American Muslim poll, we discovered that Muslims were most likely out of all the groups we looked at to experience religious discrimination um, in interpersonal institutional ways, both, um, you know, interacting with strangers in a public place, with peers at work and school, at the airport, with police, while receiving health care um, and, and in other spaces. Your study also included things like mosque opposition, um, federal legislation that is anti-Muslim, physical and verbal assaults. You used um, such a a large variety of different experiences of discrimination to create these different tools. Could you walk us through the scales you developed? So the first scale that I developed is called the Societal Anti-Muslim Discrimination Index, which is also could be defined as institutional Islamophobia or anti-Muslim discrimination. And the second one is interpersonal anti-Muslim discrimination index. And the scale items were really informed by the qualitative interviews, a review of the literature, looking at the various lawsuits that have come out against policies that have surveilled and targeted Muslim Americans, and then the expert reviewers. So these are other researchers who study anti-Muslim discrimination or Islamophobia and their expertise in this space. For example, that item that you listed regarding um, opposition to mosque construction that was actually suggested by one of the expert reviewers um, and other items like that were too as well. Um, so I thought, you know, in developing these scales, it was really important to me to make sure that they are comprehensive and grounded in the experiences of Muslim Americans, just to ensure that as researchers for capturing the full spectrum as much as possible. And by capturing that full spectrum, that's going to give us an in-depth perspective of what's going on and also help us to you know, measure the impact of anti-Muslim discrimination on Muslim Americans. What you're saying puts me in mind of a new study that was published using ISPU data from our American Muslim poll by a group of researchers in JAMA Psychiatry earlier this year that revealed that of all the faith and non-faith groups measured, Muslims have the highest um, rate of suicidality uh, of all those groups that that were looked at, at I, I believe eight percent. You know, this research is so relevant and so needed and so immediate. How can health practitioners from uh, you know both from from mental from mental health practitioners to educators to religious leaders to policymakers, what do they need to learn from this data that you published? Um, So a starting point would just be acknowledging the experience of Muslim Americans, the impact of anti-Muslim discrimination and other forms of discrimination on Muslim Americans and other minority groups in this country, and then a concerted effort to address those wrongs, um, to counter those negative stereotypes, um, to push back against harmful policies and the impact that they have on Muslims and other minority groups. I mean... I think the nation as a whole has been having a lot of conversations about discrimination, equitable treatment, health equity, et cetera, but it's going to be a a long-term initiative. It's not going to happen overnight. And as you stated, it's going to require a number of groups being involved from stakeholders, um, from policymakers to educators, to healthcare providers, et cetera. You come to this work from a health perspective. You have a background in public health, uh, medical anthropology. What's unique about studying Islamophobia through that lens? My background in public health and medical anthropology has been helpful just in terms of using different methods and theories to look at the problem and also having a historical perspective of what's going on. Um, For example, in terms of looking at the impact of discrimination on health, um, we have a number of researchers who have established that association primarily with African-American populations, right? Um, And so this research on Islamophobia is building upon that work, all right? So we've looked at race-based discrimination or racism. Now let's extend that to religious-based discrimination, which has yet to be fully explored. And I mentioned early limitations around data. And there are a number of national health surveys that 
you know, ask Americans about their health status, you know, their access to care, et cetera. And they ask, you know, basic demographic information like your race, ethnicity, age, gender, et cetera. But it's very rare to see any questions about your religious identity. Um, so to tie back, tie that back to your previous question in terms of the takeaway from my research is um, not only recognition and awareness of um, what's been going on in this country and to Muslim Americans and other minority groups, but ensuring we have access to quality data so that it's not a matter of, well, we don't know if that's happening, where we can actually push back and say, well, actually we do because we have the data and we have these findings that show that something is going on. For example, the data that ISPU put out recently regarding um, suicide rates among Muslim Americans that wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be able to share information like that if we didn't have access to data. Absolutely. And you talking about building this on the work and research that's been done into, you know, Black Americans' experiences of racism and impact on health um, reminded me that your report also cites, you know, that Muslims in America are experiencing a lot of intersecting experiences of discrimination. You know, we know from our research that um, about a third of Muslims in America are Black or African American. Um, And so, there's there's a lot that can be informed by all of these different all these different studies. I'm wondering, you touched on this a bit, but um, how can other researchers use these scales build on this work? So although these d- scales were specifically designed for my interest in health, they can be used in other domains, whether that's civic engagement, whether that's educational outcomes, just to see the impact of discrimination, because we know it's not just health, it's all matters of life. I mean, it's also related to um, your socioeconomic status in terms of opportunities available to you, et cetera. So with these scales, um, my intention in developing them was that they could be used as widely and broadly as possible and be of use to researchers working in different spaces, whether it be education, health, or sociology. And I know that um, this work was part of your dissertation and you're you're now working on a variety of other things. Where can we find you now? Where has your research taken you lately? Um, so I'm currently working in health equity still, not quite on Islamophobia or Muslim Americans, although I'm looking for ways to get back to that. But um, my current projects, given everything going on in the world right now, are really focused on COVID-19, um, specifically looking at the impact on minority racial and ethnic patient populations who have been disproportionately impacted by the virus in terms of cases and deaths. And then another project I'm working on is looking to improve maternal and child health outcomes for African-American women, Um, specifically around addressing implicit bias and integration of care so mothers and their children receive the best care possible. Thank you so much, Nahid. We're going to be sharing ways people can look look at your work and engage with your work um, in the episode notes and via our newsletter. And we just really thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you to Dr. Ahmed for your thoughtful reflections on this crucial topic. Dr. Ahmed is currently a research scientist at MedStar Health Research Institute. You can revisit and share the specifics of her research at isbu.org backslash young-scholar-awards. And don't forget to tune into our interviews with this year's Young Scholar Award first and second place winners on Deep Dives with ISBU. You can find them wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more discussions like this, subscribe today and maybe leave us a review. You can learn more about the Institute for Social Policy and Understandings Research at ISPU.org and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at the ISPU and on Instagram at the underscore ISPU. Thanks for tuning in. Tuning in.